Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Navy Pier. Today we begin a celebration of 100 years in the making of the People's Pier. May 27, 2016. The dedication of a new Ferris wheel signals big changes at Navy Pier. But Navy Pier has been continuously changing since it opened in 1916. This is what the power of government could do this. if given the opportunity. So we don't often think of the Great Lakes as a luxury cruise ship destination, right? Thousands and thousands of Chicagoans did every year. What were you thinking? <laughs> um, I really wasn't. Anybody afraid of heights? Yes, I am. You are afraid of heights? I am. How do you feel being back here right now? I'm ready to cry. Really? Oh yes, it's very emotional. That view, that can't be beat. It's really alive. It's alive, baby, it's alive. This is the story of a century of reinvention. Major funding for this program is provided by BMO Harris Bank and NICOR Gas. Additional support is provided by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, ITW, James McHugh Construction Company, SP Plus Parking, Odyssey Cruises, where moments come to life on the water, and Shoreline Sightseeing, Explore Your Chicago. Riva Crab House, Navy Pier's seafood and steak restaurant on the lakefront. And by the following. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library is proud to support Navy Pier, a century of reinvention. Named in honor of the veterans of World War I, commemorating the Navy's role in moving millions of doughboys to the front lines in France, and victory for the U.S. and its allies. Every day they come. By bus, by car, by foot, a sea of humanity descends on Chicago's Navy Pier. And the traffic jams, parking lines, and a lot of walking, a lot of walking, none of that seems to deter them one bit. I'm here at Navy Pier to ride the Ferris wheel. He is the history of Navy Pier. When I helped my dad build it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I just brought the kids down, let them experience what I've experienced in my lifetime here. This is the first time I've ever come to Navy Pier. It's really beautiful. Um, I love looking at the skyline. We've been here for like about two hours now, and I don't want to go home, to be honest. You know, in all the promotional materials, Navy Pier is always touted as the top tourist attraction in Illinois. Something like nine million people a year come here. I've got one day to learn why. The easy answer is the Ferris wheel. It looks just like you. The cruises. <laughs> not properly dressed. We said this is casual. And the views. And believe me, we'll get to all of that. But to really understand Navy Pier's appeal, we have to go back to a distant Chicago. Maybe the same location, but a much different place than the Chicago we know today. In the early 20th century, Chicago was on its way to becoming the greatest city in America, at least if you believed the hot air spewed by promoters of our windy city. But the truth was something different. The booming city had become hopelessly overcrowded and filthy. Enter the Commercial Club of Chicago, elite business leaders who commissioned a plan in 1909 to transform the chaotic city into a paradise. Their Plan of Chicago became known as the Burnham Plan for its mastermind, Daniel Burnham. 
make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood. That's a motto often attributed to Burnham. He may or may not have actually said it, but it was certainly a creed he lived by. Burnham was a natural choice to head the plan. He was already famous for building a city, the gleaming white city of Chicago's 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. But that was a temporary city of plaster and straw. This time around, Burnham and the plan's co-author, Edward Bennett, would set their sights on something much more permanent and much, much bigger. A region-wide vision for a sophisticated, efficient, even elegant Chicago, something like Paris on the prairie. Now it needed to sell the plan to the public. The city of Blowhard, so skilled in self-promotion, launched a massive PR campaign with short promotional films, favorable newspaper write-ups, and slide lectures. They even got the plan included in the curriculum of Chicago's schools. Much of the plan became reality. Like replacing the crowded jumble of wharves along the river with broad, double-decked Wacker Drive, the stately bridge at Michigan Avenue, Union Station, and of course, the lakefront park system. The plan also called for the construction of multiple piers in harbor districts along the lakefront. In 1914, work began on municipal pier number two. Why didn't they start with number one? Good question, I'll ask it in a minute. Extending more than 3,000 feet into the lake, it was the horizontal equivalent of the soaring skyscrapers Chicago was proudly building nearby. It goes five-eighths of a mile into the lake, and it doesn't sink. It's still here after 100 years. That's Douglas Bukowski, author of the definitive book on the history of Navy Pier. So who better than Doug to explain how the pier jumped from the pages of the Burnham Plan to the city's shoreline? So it's this imposing neoclassical structure. What effect is that supposed to have on people when they saw it? The whole idea was for a design like Navy Pier to impress people that they were part of a larger civic whole. This is what the power of government could do, this, given the opportunity. But the primary purpose of this great civic monument was the subject of much debate. Burnham had envisioned it for both profit and people. But the commission actually charged with building it was mostly interested in the dollar signs. Navy Pier was built um, as a kind of compromise. This is where people would go to sail. This is where people would go to take in the beautiful lake air. But there was an element of Chicago business community that wanted to keep the lake uh, commercial. Municipal Pier opened for business and pleasure on July 15, 1916. The neat part about Navy Pier is deciphering it. You look at Navy Pier, you think Beaux-Arts. That would be thanks to Navy Pier's architect, Charles Sumner Frost. He picked up on Daniel Burnham's vision to reinvent Chicago in a style of classicism imported from France called Beaux-Arts. Architects of the day considered this style to be the most appropriate for America's civic buildings. Think classic train stations like Grand Central Station in New York, or closer to home, the old Chicago and Northwestern Terminal. That was one of many stations designed by Frost with his former partner, Alfred H. Granger. They did over a hundred train stations for the Northwestern because the two of them married the daughters of the Northwestern president, okay? <laughs> by the time Frost was commissioned to design Municipal Pier, the partnership had dissolved. His train stations had been built on land, but this terminal would be surrounded by water. So the lakefront is very sandy, the, the, the waves can be very violent. You're building 3,000 feet out into the lake. How did they build this thing so it didn't get washed away? Well, if NASA ever is to go to Mars, they have to come to Chicago to study Chicago engineering. Because if you can stick a pier five-eighths of a mile out into a great lake and have it survive 100 years, these are people who can build a space colony. <laughs> ah, Chicago boosterism. It's in our DNA. In reality, the Pierce construction engineer, E.C. Shanklin, only took terrestrial contracts. And he was on familiar ground working on Daniel Burnham-inspired projects. Shanklin was Burnham's chief engineer for the World's Columbian Exposition. 
At Navy Pier, he had the not-so-small task of keeping the whole thing from sinking into the lake. He went pile-happy. In this case, pounded 20 to 27 feet below lake bottom, upon which the structure would rust. And he did this 20,000 times. What to put on top of all those piles was Frost's territory, starting with the historic head house, which you can still see today. Right there, that's still pretty much what it looked like when yes. the pier was built. Yes. What was the function of that part of the uh, pier? Well, that's where your offices were. The two towers you see there were actually hiding or holding water tanks for the original sprinkler system. Chicago being very, very, um, shall we say, uh, sensitive to, to issues of fire. Yeah, yeah, for obvious reasons. Like all good classical buildings, the ornamental features take their inspiration from where the building is and what it's supposed to do. Well, we start with the Chicago wide. Yeah, up there on the tower. That's the Trinity. It's supposed to be the three branches of the river. The river and uniting, and here's not Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but north side, west side, south side. Ah. Those almost look like dolphins or something at the top. You have a whole number of aquatic decorations. You have dolphins, you have turtles, you have fish. I think you have conches. And then there are some sort of Midwestern references like wheat stalks. What does Carl Sandberg say? Uh, stack of wheat. Stack yeah. of wheat, okay. Right, right. So, well, some of the wheat got stacked there. Uh-huh. Also, imagine the gateway that used to be Grand Avenue. The streetcar street would actually up inside go the building. Up, going straight through to service the North Shed and the South Shed. Remember, this was an industrial facility, at least in part. The freight sheds were the main interior structures running the full length of the pier, one on the north side and one on the south side. They were separated by an open-air access artery circled by streetcar tracks. Those sheds are long gone, but the other great historic feature of the pier that survives, in addition to the head house, is the grand ballroom, way out at the far east end of the pier. Probably one of the most stunning public spaces in the city of Chicago. designed by Frost as a place to meet, as a place to dance. You've got this wonderful dome, ribbed, lighted. It's simplicity itself, and it's sublime. And it's actually kind of marrying this ornate neoclassicism it's more, it, with this, this is, industrial, I mean, you right, see the more, trusses, right? This is, this is more Chicago, what we would consider Chicago form and function. So they're glorifying the structure. Yes in an incredibly delicate way. So it's originally called Municipal Pier Number Two, two. but it was the first one built. Why wasn't it called Municipal Pier Number One? Well, it, true, but Number One was going someplace else, okay? And then there was gonna be three, four, and five. The numbering system appears to refer to where the piers would be located, not the order in which they would be constructed. So what happened to all the others? They were never built. One reason was drastic inflation. The price tag for municipal pier number two was $4.5 million in 1916. Within a few years, each additional pier would have cost twice that much. And then, as we know in life, stuff happens. You get 1915 becoming 1917, and you get World War I. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so the whole focus shifts away from Chicago to Europe. America is called to arms. In New York, the first volunteers are cheered down Fifth Avenue. And along the piers, an endless chain of these young recruits march into transports, thousands of them and millions more to follow. When the U.S. declared war on Germany in 1917, Municipal Pier stepped up to the war effort. The Navy, the Army, and the Red Cross all set up training stations and recruitment centers on the pier. There was also a place for men not so eager to ship off to war. There was actually a draft Dodger roundup in the summer of 1918. They invaded then Cubs Park, checking them. A young men's draft status, and ah. those who were not meeting it ended up at Municipal Pier. Really? In holding, yeah. A jail on the lakefront wasn't in the long-term plans. 
After the Great War ended, the military moved out, and the pier entered what Bukowski calls its first golden age. This is the pier functioning as first proposed. This is where people would go for those lake breezes. This is the place you'd go for your dances. This is the place you'd go for the theater if you're a kid, or the carousel. This is where you go to the outdoor garden or for a nice beer. This is where they would go to get on the lake steamer as it was all intended. So it sounds like what attracted people to the pier early on is the same thing that attracts them today. Location, location, location. Man, it's a mob scene here in the summertime. You know, I think people flock here. Hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> because it's one of the only places in Chicago, maybe the only place, where you can get right down on the water. Unless, of course, you're in a boat. Oh, God, you pilot your church through the stormy seas of this world. Each year, Chicago's boating season begins at Navy Pier with a blessing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. For all its popular attractions, this is, after all, a working pier. Today's tour boats are kind of like the great-grandchildren of the schooners and steamships that used to dock in Chicago long before Navy Pier was built, when our main harbor was the Chicago River. The river had become the link between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi when a canal opened in 1848. This quickly made Chicago one of the busiest ports in the world. Almost overnight, the city grew from a sleepy frontier trading post into a booming metropolis. But all that success came at a price. That was a uncontrolled chaos on the river, because you're talking about several hundred vessels a day moving up and down the river. And that meant constant bridge openings. You think your commute is tough now? Try waiting for a few dozen cargo ships to pass. The standard excuse for being late for work in 19th century Chicago was, sorry boss, I was bridged. I was bridged. <laughs> Hey, next time you're late for work, you can use that excuse, courtesy of Professor Ted Karamansky. Ted's an expert on Chicago's seafaring heyday. So we chartered a yacht on Lake Michigan to learn about Navy Pier's role in the city's maritime history. And so the pier was a way to alleviate congestion. That was one of the ideas? That was one of the key elements, plus the fact that Great Lakes vessels were getting larger and larger, and it was more difficult for them to navigate the narrow confines of the Chicago River. The really big vessels preferred Chicago's other river, the Calumet, where they served a burgeoning steel industry on the city's southeast side. The ships that were going down to South Chicago tended to be uh, coal, and iron ore and vessels for heavy industry. And so the idea of a terminal pier here out on the lake was seen as a way to maybe keep that commerce coming to the heart of Chicago. Smaller freighters and passenger ships continued to ply the Chicago River, but more and more of that business moved to Navy Pier, including passenger liners like the SS Christopher Columbus, first commissioned to bring visitors to the World's Columbian Exposition and later repurposed as a Great Lakes excursion ship. So we don't often think of the Great Lakes as a luxury cruise ship destination, right? Well, we don't, but it's a lot closer than going off to the Caribbean. You think about the luxurious travel people do today as for fun. We had these vessels on the Great Lakes. It was something a lot of people did. Thousands and thousands of Chicagoans did every year. So then you have the major transportation innovation with the 20th century kind of changes the whole picture. What, what happened to shipping? In the end, it's the story of the automobile. I mean, the 20th century is the century of the automobile. By the 1920s, people could take their cars out to Michigan, up to Milwaukee, in an hour or two. But then the St. Lawrence Seaway is going to save the day, right? After decades of dreaming and planning, the St. Lawrence Seaway became a reality. In gala ceremonies, Queen Elizabeth and President Eisenhower officially opened the 2,400-mile link between deep water and the heart of the continent. There probably never was a more underbuilt, oversold project in the history of the United States than the St. Lawrence Seaway. Huh. 
Initially, it brought more shipping to Chicago than there had been, but they had expected a huge influx. This was supposed to revolutionize the economy uh, of the city, and it never happened. The St. Lawrence Seaway never lived up to the hype. It was promoted as a way to bring back Chicago's glory days as a great port city of the world. But 15 years after it opened, only a handful of freighters were docking at Navy Pier each year. And maybe that would have been just fine with Daniel Burnham. He envisioned the pier not only as a place for commerce, but also for people, at the center of a lakefront park stretching the full length of the city. You know, Ted, just standing here, just looking out on this, this is really where you see what the Burnham plan was all about. And it's remarkable. It's probably the thing about Chicago that we're most proud of. We went from a waterfront that was based upon business to a waterfront that was based on recreation, where it became not an industrial asset, but an amenity. An amenity that has become our most prized public space. And Navy Pier is both its star attraction and the hub from which you can enjoy the lakefront in almost anything that floats. Coming up on our left, Navy Pier. The pier returns, constantly reinventing itself into the recreational pier. And they are off and running in Chicago. The Louis Vuitton America's Cup World Series racing on fresh water. Got the paparazzi here. All the way. I thought this was going to be like a tourist thing. This was actually hard. <laughs> Do you have a topsail on here too? We have a gaff top and then a fisherman. On both of these? Um, no, just a gaff top for the main and the fisherman sets between the four and the main. I'm talking like I know all this stuff. Rule number one, you have to stay seated with your seatbelt on. Please. You got one. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you. Navy Pier is a living reminder that Chicago was and still is a great maritime city. I feel so comfortable when I'm out here. You know, a lot of people, um, they never get out on a lake, no, really. No, that's a shiny. Yeah. But it's very familiar to me. I mean, this is, you know, kind of how I started on television because um, I was a tour guide for the Chicago Architecture Foundation. And uh, so I get out here a lot. Can you blame me? Should we just go whenever? Yeah. He has a mic. Okay, okay. he has a mic. Oh. Okay, Lord. It's okay, y'all. We figure we come to Navy Pier, act like our inner tourists. Yeah. We're and, celebrating uh, Lorraine's 50th birthday. Spend some quality time with him before he grows up and forgets that mom is cool. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Navy Pier has always been a port of call for more than just seasoned mariners. For curious kids, there's the Children's Museum. If you're an art lover, there's Expo Chicago. Once a year, the Pier's Convention Center becomes a mega art gallery. You can spend a lot of money here, and time. Another minute gone by. This artist, Amanda Williams, would just paint a building on an empty lot. She'd go back to look for some of these buildings and they'd just be gone already. It's Chicago, 1945. We are here. Expo Chicago continues a long tradition of exhibitions trade shows and spectacles going all the way back to the administration of Mayor Big Bill Thompson. He launched the Pageant of Progress in 1921. 
there were beauty pageants. And when the World's Fair returned to Chicago in 1933, the pier offered a fine view of fascist Italian aviator Italo Balbo's famous flyover. By then, Municipal Pier had been rebranded Navy Pier for the veterans of the Great War. One of Chicago's earliest radio stations first broadcast from the North Tower, WCFL, owned by the Chicago Federation of Labor. This is WCFL, the voice of labor. Radio still emanates from Navy Pier at WBEZ, Chicago's NPR affiliate. Open them up, bring them up, and bring it under. Empty Bottle helped put Chicago's music scene on the map, and it's still going strong. The idea is for the place to look lived in, not pretentious. Another Chicago institution, if you will. In later years, there was the Modern Living Show. House wears anyone? Of course it would make sense to hold a boat show at Navy Pier. And in 1959, everyone who was anyone came to the International Trade Fair, including a young Queen Elizabeth and husband, Prince Philip. No word on whether Her Majesty slipped out the side door for a bag of shrimp at Rocky's, the legendary seafood shack right outside the pier. Today, a captain stands on the site. But just remembering Rockies makes me hungry. I don't think I got that right. We're gonna to have to do a lot more takes of this shot. Navy Pier continues its long tradition of special events. <laughs> but there was a time when parties on the pier were put on hold. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The country was thrust into another world war, and Navy Pier would play a key role in the war effort. It was converted into a Navy training center for machinists and technicians. Over the course of the war, some 60,000 recruits learned and lived on the pier, including a young New Yorker, Petty Officer First Class Herb Sohn. Before I got here, I met someone up at Great Lakes, and he said, when you go down there, get the middle bunk. The upper bunk, the pigeons come over, and they drop their little things on you. And the lower bunk, the rats will start nibbling at your toes. Good advice. Yeah. There are 3,000 sailors in one room. Someone had told me that it was cruel and unusual punishment to put two prisoners in the same cell. 3,000 sailors in one room, and everyone snored, I'm sure of it. The sleeping arrangements might have been less than ideal, but Herb has no complaints about the makeshift mess hall at the far end of the pier. The food must have been good. I went in at 145 and came out at 180, so uh -oh. the food was good. Spent the rest of my life getting back to 150. <laughs> While Herb and his mates were eating and training inside the pier, outside, two makeshift aircraft carriers used Navy Pier as their base of operations to train desperately needed fighter pilots. Navy Commander Richard F. Whitehead had realized carrier training on the east and west coasts was too dangerous because German and Japanese subs patrolled those waters. Admiral Whitehead decided, he said, you know, why don't we use Lake Michigan? It's perfect. No one knows about it and we can train all our pilots here. But of course, there weren't any aircraft carriers on the Great Lakes. So Whitehead convinced his superiors to convert two side-wheel passenger steamers, the SS C&B and the Greater Buffalo, into makeshift flat tops, renamed the Wolverine and the Sable. They allowed Navy pilots to get their CQ, or carrier qualification, and boy, did they earn it. The flight decks were about half the height above the water of normal carriers, and much shorter. The narrow margin for error, combined with the choppy seas on Lake Michigan, proved too much for many rookie pilots. Fatalities were few, but as many as 250 Navy planes were lost to the bottom of Lake Michigan. Some of those planes are still being recovered. Despite those mishaps, many of the pilots trained on the Sable and Wolverine wreaked havoc over Europe and the Pacific, including future president George H.W. Bush. In every town and hamlet across the nation, the story was the same. Chicago heard the news, and a hurricane of unrestrained hilarity blew through the windy city. 
training of our pilots here in Lake Michigan probably contributed to the winning of the war. Here's something that saves America, and Chicago should be proud of it. Even after more than half a century, the memories haven't faded. How do you feel being back here right now? I'm ready to cry. Really? Oh yes, it's very emotional. It was probably one of the best times of my life. When you're from New York, they convince you that there's no other place in the world to be. When I came out here, the people were so sensational, and the city was so nice, just threw their arms out for us, that I really said that uh, I'm coming back and living in Chicago. That's where I wanted to be. Men like Herb Sohn, who trained here, would not be the last people to be schooled at Navy Pier. When the war ended, thousands of American veterans returned home with a promise from the U.S. government, a college education. But the GI Bill didn't cover enough tuition for expensive private schools, and state schools like Champaign-Urbana were too far away from any vets and already crowded. Hmm, if only a large enough facility could be found near downtown Chicago. My name is Bernard Baum. In 1953, I was a freshman at the University of Illinois at Chicago, known to us as Navy Pier. The University of Illinois Chicago Undergraduate Division, a two-year college which some called Harvard on the Rocks, opened in the fall of 1946, albeit with some quirks. You would sit in class and all of a sudden there'd be a train coming down the middle of the pier and you would sort of wait for them to pass and then continue. You walked very fast because you could be in the front of the school and you could have to go to the back of the school and that was a long trip and you had to really move. But we were young, we didn't care, and we could move pretty fast. Notable alumni who made the five-eighths of a mile dash to class include Illinois Governor Jim Thompson, CNN news anchor Bernard Shaw. You were at Navy Pier when the University of Illinois what Chicago was at Navy Pier. Yeah, what and, what and beloved children's author Shel Silverstein, although he was expelled after a rough freshman year. Remember, we weren't just going to school. Most of us were working. So we were really on the go almost all the time. In addition to ships and longshoremen, the students shared the pier with conventioneers. In at least one case, that proved to be a fringe benefit. One of our great things every year was the restaurant show. And every year for a week, we ate like kings. It was wonderful. Whenever I see somebody who went to school with me, we always talk about that. From the beginning, the pier was seen as a temporary solution. Mayor Richard J. Daley was committed to finding a permanent home for the university in Chicago. After a years-long battle over site selection, the city bulldozed more than 100 acres of Little Italy and Greek town to build a modernist concrete college designed by Walter Netsch, dubbed Chicago Circle Campus probably the only college ever named for a highway interchange. Students left the pier in 1965, but the city benefited for decades from the lessons they learned there. A lot of the doctors, a lot of the dentists, a lot of the professionals that are in the city at my age originally came out of this school because most of us were in the same situation economically. So it was really a great experience. With school out and the shipping industry slowly disappearing, Navy Pier found itself on life support by the 1970s. But new hope for resuscitation came from Mayor Michael Belandic. There has been some nostalgia that has been developing. He staged the first Chicago Fest there in 1978. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wasn't it Mayor Jane Byrne who started Chicago Fest? That's what I always thought. But Mayor Byrne actually tried to cancel the fest when she took office in 1979, according to the Tribune's Rick Kogan. By the way, in that same article, he described the pier as, quote, crumbling and rat infested. The mayor's decision was met with loud opposition from the public and labor unions. And so if you can't beat them, she rebranded it Mayor Byrne's Chicago Fest and she even got into the act by introducing the Blues Brothers from the stage. Festival goers came by the tens of thousands. It was the most diverse collection of musicians you've ever seen. It was just amazing, all the intensity, all the power, just the people going back and forth. Dubbed Rock Around the Dock, the pier featured multiple stages for rock and roll, country, jazz, and the blues. My name is Eddie Clearwater. 
better known as Eddie the Chief Clearwater. I played at Chicago Fest between 79 and 83. I hope it will come back because I had a good time. On the bill in 1981 was an up and coming band from Berwyn, Illinois, Survivor. I'm Jim Peterick. As one of the founding members of Survivor, I left the band years ago, but I still have fond, fond memories of playing Chicago Fest. And I remember the whole band was very nervous about this because this was a big deal. This is one of our first big shows. The place went crazy. Only a Chicago audience would respond like that. Those were the magic days for me. The main stage was set up just outside the entrance to the pier, and the best seats were first come, first served. One of my favorite bands was Cheap Trick. I just remember the helicopters going around doing video and then the rush of the stage and everything. It was just like, wow, there's a lot of excitement here. At the time, it's like, this is like the greatest concert in the world. So many more big name artists played Chicago Fest, we'd go broke licensing all the clips for this show. But this clip of blues legend Muddy Waters was too good to pass up. I was like 16 years old. We caught his last few songs and I had some film left in the camera and they got some really, really nice photos. I think he passed away within about a year and a half after that. It's like, man, this is really, really good stuff. And I love y'all, just don't work on it. Buoyed by the success of Chicago Fest, Mayor Byrne commissioned a nearly $300 million plan to redevelop the pier into a festival marketplace like Boston's Faneuil Hall. That deal was scuttled when Harold Washington defeated Byrne in 1983, although he was inaugurated in the pier's grand ballroom. Washington commissioned a new plan to convert the pier into something more like an urban park. Restoring Navy Pier to allow maximum use of Chicago's lakefront. That reflected his vision for a more inclusive Chicago. But that plan died suddenly with Mayor Washington in 1987. The following year, Washington's successor, Eugene Sawyer, finally succeeded in getting a viable plan going. It's in the best interest of the taxpayers to completely renovate Navy Pier. But it was the next mayor, Richard M. Daley, along with then Governor James R. Thompson, who did most of the heavy lifting to make the dream a reality. Remember, Thompson was an alum of the University of Illinois at Navy Pier. With all that clout working overtime, the pier's rebirth was off and running. The city of Chicago sold Navy Pier for $10 to a newly created independent corporation that would run both the pier and McCormick Place, so people nicknamed it McPier. A design competition was held, but much to the dismay of preservationists, the old freight sheds were torn down in 1991, even before a final design was chosen. The winner of the competition was the Chicago architecture firm VOA, along with New England architect Benjamin Thompson, designer of Faneuil Hall. We'd like to thank all those who are rededicating Navy Pier. It belongs to the people of Chicago. Thank you very much. The pier that opened to much fanfare in 1995 gave Chicago its very own festival marketplace, featuring all the attractions we know so well today. And if you measure success by sheer volume of visitors, the pier was a rip-roaring success. Oh, I wish they had had something like this when I was a kid. <laughs> but from the beginning, the design was criticized for clutter and kitsch. Everyone seemed to love the Ferris wheel and the carousel, but critics lambasted the architecture of the new Navy Pier and wondered if its roof would leak. The Tribune's the eminent architecture, architecture critic, Blair Kamen, later described the pier's, quote, carnivalesque commercialism that alienated many Chicagoans and gave the pier a hard-to-shed reputation as a tacky tourist trap, end quote. It's another mistake, by the way. In 2010, pier officials decided the impending centenary gave Chicago an opportunity to, in Blair Kamen's words, hit the reset button.
reinvention. It's a concept Navy Pier has been very familiar with for its entire 100 year history. Out with the old and in with whatever's next. And as in the past, when the call went out seeking new design proposals, there was a long list of suitors. A Navy Pier Advisory Committee has selected five finalists in a competition to give the pier an extreme makeover. This is a case, Phil, of following Daniel Burnham's advice to make no little plans. These plans are definitely bold, but Navy Pier officials say that is what they wanted. The winning proposal came from the New York-based landscape architecture firm James Corner Field Operations. They zeroed in on what many felt was the pier's biggest problem. You can be blunt. What, what was wrong with Navy Pier before? It was more focused on commercialism and entertainment and it had a kind of carnival-esque atmosphere. It was perceived as maybe a place that was just for tourists, mm -hmm. you know, not for locals. But designers Keith O'Connor and Sarah Astheimer of Field Operations had to be careful. Although the kitschy festival marketplace concept seemed dated, it wasn't exactly hurting the bottom line. They still had plenty of people coming, they have a big crowd, but I think there wasn't the same kind of civic pride that people had for other Chicago institutions. Navy Pier CEO Marilyn Gardner wrestled with the same question. If it ain't broke, <laughs> why fix it? Well, we recognize that it was not broken, that it was hugely successful and far exceeded anyone's expectations. But after seeing what could be done when Millennium Park was developed, it really showcased that higher design and being open and accessible to the public shouldn't be mutually exclusive. One of the important parts of what we were trying to do is create a space that was authentic for the city. So how did these out-of-town architects set about creating something authentically Chicago? Well, they drew on their experience reinventing a relic of New York's industrial past, the High Line. And they focused on what charmed them most about Navy Pier its lakefront location. I think us being from out of town in some ways helped because every time we came to the pier, you'd see the water and this incredible color of the water and the horizon and you're just blown away and said, we need to make sure people see that, experience that, emphasize that. To bring out the best of Navy Pier, the designers went on a mission to declutter, removing barriers that compartmentalized the pier. And that began with the front porch a 17-acre green space now called Polk Brothers Park. It was always seen as a precursor, something that you went through to get to Navy Pier. You weren't at Navy Pier until you got onto South Dock. Polk Brothers Park for us was all about entrance and arrival and about creating space for the community that would engage people. I think you can see in the background right now, quite engaging for young people. There used to be literally a wall and a gate and that marked the threshold. And one of the first things we said is, we have to take that away so that Polk Brothers Park and South Dock and Navy Pier are integrated. For the first time in years, you could walk onto South Dock and look all the way to the end of the pier. You could get a glimpse of the horizon and the lake and understand the pier's massive size and scale. Our big move was to say, Polk Brothers Park needs to be part of Navy Pier. So we took some of the greenery of Polk Brothers Park, the trees and the grass, and we pulled it onto South Dock. And you look back toward the city, there's this incredible corridor that's lined with an alley of trees that aligns with Illinois Street and runs back into the grid of Chicago. The designers also understood something that seems obvious now. The boats were blocking the view. It was a huge problem. Not only the location of the boats occluding views, but also all of the correspondent infrastructure that goes along with them. When we started, you couldn't actually get to the edge of, of South Dock. There was a big six foot wide utility trench that was a jumble of, of drainage and power lines and all kinds of things. We buried all of those utilities. We did this great custom grading. We kept the old historic bollards. We painted them a nice bright color. And in a few places, particularly at the lake pavilions, we created a roof for shade. We organized the ticket booths 
and the concessions, and perhaps most significantly, we brought a railing in and allowed people to literally get right to the edge of the pier, which never used to be the case. It was very important to create better connections to the water. It's really a phenomenal, unique location that we needed to take better advantage of. But the designers gave us more to look at than just the skyline. They replaced the old grand staircase with this eye-catching wave wall. So the wave wall was a really grand expression about refocusing attention on the Ferris wheel and a seamless connection from South Dock to Pier Park. So it sort of draws you up? It draws you up, but it also serves as this amazing audience space for viewing fireworks or viewing ships or viewing the lake. At night, we have lighting that's integrated underneath the stair treads, and so that glows at night. So there's all these different ways that we've incorporated lighting into the project, very much being about the experience of being on the lakefront at night, which is one of the most extraordinary things. What were the things that you saw that made you think, wow, I want to get my hands on this pier? You can walk the pier and see many different types of people, all ages, all genders, and if you want a place to lounge and relax, you can do that at the very end. That's an exciting project, one that can engage with many, many, many different people. I really feel that all Chicagoans have a story or a connection to the pier in some form or fashion, whether it's through their grandparents, their friends, or themselves personally. I think Navy Pier is iconic Chicago. So if Navy Pier is iconic Chicago, what's iconic Navy Pier? Look up. For all the attractions on the pier, it's the one above that grabs the most attention. Towering 20 stories above the lakefront, the Ferris Wheel is an homage to the world's first Ferris Wheel, erected in Chicago way back in 1893. George Washington Gale Ferris answered a challenge from Daniel Burnham to create a larger-than-life attraction for the World's Columbian Exposition. Ferris pushed the limits of 19th century engineering. The result was a wheel more than 26 stories tall. Each of the 36 cars was the size of a streetcar and carried 60 people. That's 2,160 riders at a time. You know, Daniel Burnham challenged us to make no little plans. Now, that wheel might not be as big as the one from 1893, but I think Mr. Burnham would approve. Named the Centennial Wheel in honor of the pier's 100th anniversary in 2016, it replaced an earlier Ferris wheel that had spun over the pier for more than two decades. With 42 gondolas, this wheel can hold 332 riders at a time. Today, I'll be one of them. Eventually. There are a lot of perks to being a TV host, but apparently cutting in line isn't one of them. Unlike the open air gondolas on the previous wheel, these are enclosed and climate controlled for year round riding. Comfy. Anybody afraid of heights? Yes, I am. You are afraid of heights? I am. Anybody have to go to the bathroom? <laughs> oh no. Oh yeah, me. Yeah, you do? Okay, you're gonna have to wait. <laughs> now, where are you from? Michigan City, Indiana. Oh, right. You can see your house from here. Yeah. <laughs> That's a TV camera right there. Hey, hi. <laughs> Did you know that the uh, first Ferris wheel was in Chicago? Can't, look can't out. turn. Can't. Okay. <laughs> Don't look out the window. Do you want like blinders? Like a, a, a ride on the Ferris wheel lasts about 15 minutes, unless you want to make headlines. Then you'll have to ride just a little longer. 48 hours, 8 minutes, and 25 seconds. Without sleep. Without sleep. That's Clinton Shepard, known as the Ferris Wheel Guy. Back in 2013, on the old Navy Pier Wheel, he set a Guinness World Record for the longest Ferris Wheel ride. Which raises the question, what were you thinking? <laughs> um, I really wasn't. Um, everybody that knows me knows I'm kind of not the normal average guy. Um, I'm getting that idea. Was there any point during the experience where you thought, this was not a good idea? Why am I doing this? <laughs> 
Um, I probably want to say the second night. The temperature dropped, so they actually had to shrink wrap the gondola that I was in. So that's when I started asking myself, like, yeah, you didn't really think this through. Clinton's not only a thrill seeker, he's also the operations manager of the wheel and the other carnival rides that surround it. It's a place of amusement, but when it comes to the Ferris wheel, Clinton and his team need to know some physics. The 500-ton wheel has to stay in balance to operate safely. With those seven segments, if we load two gondolas, we have to maintain those in all the other segments as well. When we need to add more, we have to wait until that first segment comes down, and we add from there. It's trying to lift a bunch of people exactly. up. So if one side is heavier than the others, then the weights will kick in and give oh. us the weight that we need to pull it down. Guaranteeing a smooth ride is essential, not just for safety, but for romance. So it seems like it'd be a good place to pop the question. Yes, it's the perfect place, <laughs> the perfect place. You're up 200 feet in the air. You're in a perfectly elegant gondola. You got the, the fireworks in the background, so it's the perfect time to do so it. So you time it. If you make that arrangement proper, we can time it very well for you. What if she says no? Um, I feel sorry for the gentleman. <laughs> I wish him the best of luck. Have you ever had this situation? Um, yes, we've had one. One that I've only known about. Where, we, somebody said, where she said where no? She, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, and on the whole well, we had over 600 proposals. So that's oh, you one out of 600 isn't bad That's a good all. record. Yeah. So if you're worrying about getting down on one knee, just head for the Ferris wheel. The odds are in your favor. Among the millions of Navy Pier visitors every year, you might spot Hamlet, Lady Macbeth, or Othello. Because the pier is home to Chicago Shakespeare Theater. Not looking bad for a guy who's been dead 400 years. This wooden bust of the bard presides over the lobby of the theater's main stage, which is loosely modeled on William Shakespeare's own Globe Theater in London. Even before the show begins, there's plenty of action backstage. It's a show about war, so we get ready. We're kind of method back here. As actors and dressers and prop people prepare for performances as many as 15 times a week, it all made me wonder, what would it feel like? Did my heart love till now, forswear its sight, for I ne'er saw true beauty till this night. How'd I do? Uh, I think you're hired. Totally. Really? Yes, you're hired, but we'll put a wig on you. Okay, yeah, yeah. Romeo yeah. is a little younger yeah. than I am. <laughs> That harsh but fair criticism <laughs> comes from Barbara Gaines. She founded Chicago Shakespeare and runs it with executive director Chris Henderson. They moved the theater to the pier in 1999, albeit with some trepidation. We thought long and hard about, is the pier a good place for Shakespeare? We did some soul searching and, and um, knew that Shakespeare would want his theater here. He was the people's playwright, and this is the people's pier. Shakespeare's Globe Theatre was located on the south bank of the River Thames in London, a waterfront site where people went for popular entertainment, not high art. To Chris and Barbara, that sounded a lot like Navy Pier. Most people associate Shakespeare as something for the elite, but really Shakespeare was popular entertainment. He in was, his day. and he wrote for just common, ordinary people like Shakespeare. You know, he didn't know he was Shakespeare. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> now, for the benefit of England's peace, May I remain the map of infamy? Then thus our steeled battle shall be ranged. What's the capacity in here? 500. 500. That's amazing. I mean, it doesn't look like 500. Mm -hmm. no. That's the trick of it. That's but it's it very is. intimate. That creates a lot of um, a pressure, really, on your prop people, on your costume people, right? You're right. Those dresses that cross this thrust stage, they need to be beautifully created, beautifully hemmed. The wigs have to be perfect. If that's not there, it's all lost. And the audience it is being so there, close. That's right. Can't get away with anything nope. at the thrust stage. Nope. A thrust stage has audience on three sides. 
and Barbara, Chris, and I will need to quickly exit this thrust stage because the performance is about to begin. Well, there's no curtain, but <laughs> curtain time. Uh, what's going on backstage right now? Well, the actors are getting together. The crew is probably back there getting the props ready, and people are warming up. So both of you really have been doing this for a whole long time. <laughs> Do you still get butterflies? <laughs> Always. Theater is high anxiety and high thrills and everything in between. And I always want to forget my hat because it's a hat and it's easy to forget. But remember the hats. I should write it on my mirror and lipstick. <laughs> the magic of theater is that it really does become a great teamwork. And everybody works together to open this play. Turns out that decision to move to the pier has paid off. Navy Pier and Shakespeare fit together like Romeo and Juliet, but with a much happier ending. Chicago Shakespeare gives the audience an intimate experience. But at Navy Pier's other theater, bigger is better in every way. Hi, I'll have a tub of popcorn. That's right, a tub, a unit of measurement somewhere between enormous and gargantuan. I'll take a quart of butter, please. Here you are. Thank you. Thank you. Supersized snacks are only fitting since the screen at the IMAX theater is roughly 5,000 square feet. That means everyone who appears on it is a really big star. I feel like I'm right there. Navy Pier itself has played a starring role in some major motion pictures. Seems like Hollywood directors just can't resist the lakefront location and skyline views. But why do so many of them insist on blowing the whole thing up? In this case, the pier was caught in the crossfire between Autobots and Decepticons. Cue the hero. Who's up for a little dystopian capture the flag? Navy Pier as a post-apocalyptic playground? What would Daniel Burnham think? When the Joker throws Chicago, AKA Gotham, into chaos, where do the citizens go to escape? Navy Pier, of course. Now that's one sightseeing boat I wouldn't want to give a tour on. Even in the days when the pier was a dilapidated white elephant, Hollywood loved it. Plenty of room for an Arnold Schwarzenegger car chase. Well, here's a great view of what the South Dock used to look like, minus the heavy artillery. And Martin Scorsese tried to hustle us into thinking he filmed his fast Eddie Felsen sequel in Atlantic City, but true Chicagoans weren't fooled. Of course, that's not on the boardwalk, that's Navy Pier's Grand Ballroom. For all its theatrical attractions, the most popular show at Navy Pier doesn't involve actors. The ancient Chinese thought fireworks kept evil spirits away. Here at the pier, they draw people in. But long before the crowds gather at night, preparation for the show begins at an off-site location. This is what it looks like at the ground level of a fireworks display. For Navy Pier, yes it does. So essentially how this all works. Matt Peterson has spent a quarter century designing fireworks shows for Melrose Pyrotechnics. He explained how it all works and I tried to keep up, but it's a little hard to pay attention when you're surrounded by live mortars. That's okay, you can touch that like yes, that. I, I got a little nervous that. when no, you did okay. that. No, okay. That. Matt assured me we were safe for this interview. He even let me handle the merchandise. Can I see a shell? You absolutely can. I actually can. hold a shell? As long as you don't drop it. Ha, huh, no pressure there. It looks okay, pretty so innocuous for something that could blow you to smithereens. This is a six inch shell. Wait, this is, this is a rocket? This is a fireworks shell, not a rocket. I was expecting, you know, Roadrunner, the thing that looks like a little rocket ship with a nose cone on it. Yeah. In a typical show at Navy Pier, about 2,000 shells explode. 
So that's how long it takes to get where it's going before, do you say explodes? Sure. I'll let you say that. Yeah. Well, what would you call it? Uh, deflagrate would be... Deflagrate? Yeah, it would be okay, the, the, like the correct terminology. I stand corrected. 2,000 shells deflagrate. It's all part of a $1 billion fireworks industry nationwide that you thought you burned through cash quickly. These literally are bombs bursting in air, but they call to mind lovely flowers. And in fact, they have names like chrysanthemum, peony, and dahlia. So is there anything specific about a show for Navy Pier? We want to cover uh, a broad range of the people that are going to be there to see it. And so we actually start with the soundtrack. What makes a good soundtrack for a fireworks show? Emotion. It's what impacts the person. Mm -hmm. And then what we do to that music is what brings out your emotions. I also think about like the setting, right? You have the skyline of Chicago, you have the lake. The lake reflects fireworks. It all plays part in the design. So you're kind of like painting in the sky. Absolutely, yeah. That's amazing. We're artists, yeah. <laughs> but it's artistry on a schedule. This barge has to make its Navy Pier by sundown. Meanwhile, back at the pier, I'm sure I can find plenty of ways to pass the time. You know, anywhere else in Chicago, you walk down the street with a beer in your hand, you get a ticket. Uh-oh. Looks like the only fireworks today might be courtesy of Mother Nature. Fortunately, the storm passes just in time to take a dinner cruise with our film crew to celebrate a long day's work. Well, we gotta get this. It looks like it gets shallow in there. Is that sand I'm seeing? Yeah, it's sand getting picked up from the wall. Now the jump along crab case comes with a There we go. That view, that can't be beat. Under the stars, the crowds gather for the fireworks. I marvel at the sea of humanity so with Michelle Boone, the pier's questions. chief of public programs. You know, as you're talking to me, I'm looking around, I'm looking behind you. Look at all these people. It's really alive. It's alive, baby, it's alive. <laughs> you know, more than nine million plus people come to the pier. <laughs> But that's what's so great about the pier, because it's free. It attracts people from all over the city, that they all embrace it as their own. And so it's this great convergence of cultures and ethnicities that all are attracted to this common place. So after 100 years, has Navy Pier finally figured out what it is? I think it'll always evolve. That's the beauty of Navy Pier, that over time, uh, it morphs and changes as the city changes. This ain't your mama's Navy Pier, right? That it's changed, and it really has upped this game that 
It's really quite lovely and classy. Imagine that, the word classy. Classy and Navy Pier in yes, the same sentence. classy, imagine that. <laughs> so it's evolved. So, at the start of this show, I said I had one day to find out why Navy Pier is such a tourist magnet. Oh, man. And I'll admit, like many Chicagoans, I was skeptical. I think that's the one I was holding in my hand. But after spending all summer at the pier, okay, it actually took a lot more than one day to film this show, here's what I finally figured out. Virtually every other part of Chicago's lakefront is parkland. Navy Pier is the only lakefront location in the city that offers both the beautiful views and, yes, the commercial attractions you find in other great waterfront cities. Standing shoulder to shoulder amidst the diversity of Chicago, I feel hopeful that as more of the pier is improved, we can reclaim it as a destination for Chicagoans and not just tourists that it will truly find its identity as envisioned so long ago by Daniel Burnham. The People's Pier. Major funding for this program is provided by BMO Harris Bank and NICOR Gas. Additional support is provided by the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, ITW, James McHugh Construction Company, SP Plus Parking, Odyssey Cruises, where moments come to life on the water, and Shoreline Sightseeing, Explore Your Chicago, Riva Crab House, Navy Pier's seafood and steak restaurant on the lakefront, and by the following. The Pritzker Military Museum and Library is proud to support Navy Pier, a century of reinvention. Named in honor of the veterans of World War I, commemorating the Navy's role in moving millions of doughboys to the front lines in France, and victory for the U.S. and its allies. <laughs>